Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Why don't you tell us your name and um, what instrument you play? I'm Bayberry Lanning Shaw, and I'm a bassoonist. I play bassoon. Excellent, excellent. And you're with the Atlanta Musicians Orchestra? That's correct. Among other things, many other things, knowing your <laughs> background a bit. Well, tell me a bit, where, where, do you, where were you raised? Where did you start uh, studying music? I grew up in Murray, Kentucky. My dad was a professor at Murray State. Oh. And uh, in middle school, I took saxophone. And my parents had heard that if I played a double reed instrument, I could get a scholarship to college. So they, and they didn't care a lot for a saxophone. <laughs> so... <laughs> They took me to uh, a symphony, you know, we went to the symphony on and off, but I remember going to a specific, like a small wind ensemble where you could really hear the oboe and the bassoon, and I really liked the sound of both, mm -hmm. and, um, but there was something about the bassoon, so we looked into it, and we were able to borrow a, a nice bassoon from Murray State University and my grandmother paid for lessons and I had a wonderful teacher, Scott Erickson at Murray State. And so it was my freshman year of high school that I switched over. So I was quite behind everyone else, um, but I didn't do marching band. So I just stayed inside and practiced a lot. And within a year or so, I was, I was catching up. Fun. And did you major in music? Yeah, um, so uh, through high school, you know, ended up continuing to do well with bassoon, just clicked with me, even though saxophone may be one of the easiest instruments. Um, technically, bassoon is one of the hardest. It's got a lot of keys and tricky fingerings and nine keys with your, with your thumb. <laughs> um, but somehow it just, it just was me. So I did well. I ended up uh, first chair in all state symphony uh, in Kentucky, which had been my big goal. And uh, my friend who's a clarinetist also won her chair. So we had a great time at all state. And so that got the attention of different universities and bassoonists are in demand. So I ended up auditioning for several and I chose Miami University of Ohio. So that's in Oxford, Ohio. I had an excellent teacher there, John Hurd. And I was there for four years. Uh, and, and that was your major? Yeah, I was music major, music performance. Mm -hmm. Got a full scholarship. So my Perfect. parents are right. <laughs> well, and it's, uh, it's quite a gift to us at the AMO that you're, you're playing so well. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks. Well, it's great to have a place to play, you know, even though I, um, my career went in a different direction. Um, I, you know, all those hours and all the work and uh, learning an instrument, you certainly want to use it. And it's a delight when you have a good part and uh, you have a little solo or something, it's always a thrill. Yeah. And I, I saw in your resume that you minored in international studies and uh, arts management. That's right. Yeah. And so that, because of the arts management, I had to take business classes mm -hmm. and that kind of steered me towards getting my MBA um, for graduate school. I was at home kind of trying to figure out what I was gonna do. And I thought, well, I don't have the laser focus it takes to be uh, a symphony performer. You know, as you know, I have a lot of interests and I didn't wanna teach. So I thought, well, maybe I'll take a few more business classes because I had enjoyed what I uh, did for the arts management minor. And one thing led to another. I just continued and got my MBA in international marketing. Lovely, lovely. And that's what you've been doing since. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And I lived in New York, Philadelphia, Louisville before Atlanta, and uh, have been in digital marketing, project management, um, customer relationship management um, since then. And you're doing also a lot of uh, computer work, also computer programming, marketing, setting up marketing uh, structures, web and- um, Marketing campaigns. Yeah, yeah. 
But I am surprised at the sidebar that someone from Kentucky would say Louisville instead of Louisville. <laughs> <laughs> um, did I say Louisville? Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> said Louisville. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you know, I went to college at Central College in Danville. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. And actually, Saren, one of our clarinetists, also went the same, same four years I did. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we have, we have a Kentucky contingency there. <laughs> um, so when did you move to Atlanta? 2006, we moved here. So yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, yeah, we never thought we'd be here for so long. Um, I really liked Louisville. It's a good sized city and had a lot of good things going on there. But um, Atlanta, you know, I don't like the sprawl and always the, you know, being in your car, but it's, um, it's got a little bit of everything and you can find your place and you find good groups and good people. Let me ask you, Bayberry, how has this um, quarantine or semi-quarantine affected you musically anyway, or even other ways? Well, it, you know, it's a shame that we're not meeting weekly to practice. So um, I've been missing that. Um, I've got a lot of things going on right now, so it's been actually helpful to have a little extra time. Um, so, uh, but I am, I am hoping that, you know, in the spring we can get back together and get back to performing. I am too. I am too. Well, tell me, you have a lot of other interests that are fascinating. Um, I, I know you do travel a lot. I imagine some was on business and some was for pleasure. So mm -hmm. what? What's some of your favorite? What are some of your favorite places? Well, my, my current favorite is Scotland. Yeah. Just in love with Scotland. I've gone the last couple of years and I did a, a painting workshop in Skye and I've developed some really good friends over there. So I was hoping to go back again this year, but that was off. So, um, but England, my mom and I traveled to England many times um, we have some friends and family there, so um, we always kind of pick a new area to to really uh, go through and see the big big sites. And you know, we're hif history buffs, so we're, uh, there's just so much to explore there. And Ireland as well. We had a great trip to Ireland. Um, but you know, I've been to 55 countries. Um, I enjoy traveling anywhere. Um, I like um, you know the Far East. Um, been to I spent a lot of time in Turkey and Istanbul, Pakistan, been to Singapore. So I've been very fortunate to be able to travel so much. Yeah. But my, my dad started that. He was a professor in sociology and started the department in, at Kenyatta University in Kenya. So I was able to go there as a teenager and spend time uh, in Nairobi. Yeah, it's quite an amazing country, Kenya. Hmm. Did a lot of traveling there too for the United Nations on our work. Oh, wow. It was just stunning. But I have yeah. to say, Scotland is is pretty special to me too. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I really enjoy your story about getting on a boat in uh, um, near the Hebrides and uh, and hearing some music being played on the boat's loudspeakers. <laughs> and yeah. Really right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, at uh, Fingen's Cave. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. the Mendelssohn, and we had just played yeah. the cycle. Yeah, we part. played it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Goodness. Well, speaking of music, what is what's your favorite period or composer or piece? Um, I used to say Bartok a lot. I really like Bartok. Um, I like that he incorporated folk, folks uh, tunes into his music, but I I love Brahms. Um, my old favorite, um, probably because we we performed it at the Allstate um, concert was the Brahms second movement or was it fourth symphony second movement? Uh, that was that's an old favorite. Um, Beethoven, of course. Yeah, Brahms is not easy to play. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's one of the more difficult for uh, for a community orchestra. Uh, but. Yeah well worth it and I you know I think of, of all the programs you've played with us how long have you been with us in fact now Dahan I'd love to know that I need to figure <laughs> that out it has been 
it's probably been 10 years. Um, I had, you know, the one year I took off to, uh, to be able to have time to train for an Ironman triathlon, um, but then came back. But um, it feels like it's been 10 years. I mean, just mentally, it's, it seems like it's been a long time, but I need to go back and find what the date is. Yeah, it's been about then because I came on about 11 years ago. So Okay. Um, now, it was a um, pretty small group back then. Yeah. We've grown and filled in the sections. It's really nice. Yeah, and we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, yeah. Of all the concerts you've played in, which have been many, um, did you have a favorite concert or a favorite piece that um, you played in? You put me on the spot here. I am terrible at remembering <laughs> <laughs> which which P's and even if you ask me which one we're playing on the, the same day, I might be <laughs> momentarily at a loss. Um, usually anything with a bassoon solo. How about that? <laughs> Good. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, but well you mentioned the Ironman Triathlon. Tell me a little bit about how you started that, you know, what you're doing now. Well, uh, my dad was a big triathlete and marathoner, so I did my first triathlon when I was 11. Oh. And I have done almost 70 triathlons now, mostly sprint and Olympic size. Um, but about, I guess, 10 years ago, I got into um, a no boundaries triathlon group in Atlanta uh, of um, people doing endurance sports. And they just pulled me up to the next level. And, and before I knew it, I was training for a half Ironman. And uh, I never thought I'd be able to, to do a half or certainly not a full because I have some, some back and hamstring issues from marathoning years ago. And, uh, but somehow I managed to pull myself together and did the half Ironman, which takes about seven hours. And, uh, and then said, I'm going to do the full, even if I have to walk the marathon. <laughs> and I managed to do it and, and almost hit my goal. My, my dad had done the Kona Ironman in 14 hours, just barely over 14 hours. Um, and, you know, and that's a really tough one with the heat and the wind. Um, so it's amazing to me that he did it in that amount of time, considering the, the equipment and the training, like he, there's so much more we know about everything, you know, if, what you should eat. And, um, and so I was able to do it in 14 hours and 10 minutes. So I got pretty close to the goal. Fantastic. And, and it was the end of September and it was 95 degrees. Jeez. So that was pretty harsh. <laughs> It was like being in Hawaii. <laughs> are you still um, are you still training for it? No, I mean, I, I, I run. I'm doing a lot of trail running right now. I didn't, you know, with the pools closed, I didn't swim except uh, in a, you know, river at our cabin. Um, minimal biking. I've just, I've, I've been focusing on, on my painting and artwork in recent months and um, some personal things to take care of. So just kind of taking this time to refocus on some things that have been on my list for many years and um, kind of putting the, the exercise to this. I mean, of course, I'm trying to just stay fit right. so that next year I won't have a too big of a hill to climb to get back. But um, but I love the trail running and it's easier on, on your body all around. So I keep doing that and I, I think I'll be fine to get back to it next spring. Super. Um, what about what about your painting? I mean, I've seen some of your work and it's it's quite exemplary, but why don't you tell us about it? Thanks. Um, yeah, I've got, uh, you know, I was always a, a painter and artist growing up. My, my parents were really into art. So art and music. So um, I got serious, probably we were Louis in Louisville and start and moved to Atlanta. I started painting again. And I did a whole series of florals and had shows at the Atlanta Botanical Garden and Memphis Botanical Garden. 
And then um, right now I'm starting a new series based on early human art. And so um, I've been fortunate to travel and often with my mom to ancient sites all over the world, um, you know, like Stonehenge, but also Malta, Newgrange in Ireland, um, Brittany, France, and certainly Scotland. So I've taken all of that as my inspiration and put it into a new series of, of art that I call Dawn of the Creative Spirit. Tell us a little bit about it. It sounds like you've really sucked up your parents' love of the arts and your father's sociology slash mm -hmm. anthropology. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, I think it's just the curiosity of, of ancient people. And um, I just think it's so fascinating that what you see on cave walls that may be 25,000 years old in Lesco. France, um, we still see those and say, God, that's beautiful. You know, that, that concept of beauty that we have, it has not changed since then. And uh, so I, I love, I, we were just in New Mexico and we saw a lot of petroglyphs. And I, it's so interesting to me to consider why they put certain symbols or characters what did it mean? You know, there's so much that that's uh, there's not a lot of mystery left in the world that uh, you know, humans have gone into all corners of things, but there's still a lot that we don't know about our 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 early ancestors and what. Um, but their artwork shows what inspired them and what interests them or uh, what was important to their survival. So. I like to delve into that and pick out what I think is beautiful and uh, match it with a stone or texture. Um, I'm, I, I love stone and, and, uh, and then just kind of create something new out of it. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned let's go and it, it's just, you know, the, the witnessing of the human touch, you know, in a very straightforward manner, in a very sincere manner, it's, it's very, it's very moving, you know, in many ways. It really is. And, 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 and the, I mean, it's almost like that the ability that they had to draw horses and see the lions is so accurate. It looks modern. Um, and then you don't see such detail for a while in other places until a more recent times. So it's just curious of how they were so, you had some really excellent artists way back then. And, and using all natural materials, obviously, there's nothing artificial. Mm -hmm. What sort of media do you, do you use? Usually oil, um, sometimes acrylic. I've been using a lot of pumice medium, which is an acrylic with a kind of a grit in it. So you can build up the canvas and I've created labyrinths that, that come off the canvas about half inch. Um, and uh, stone axes and uh, an auric, which is an ancient type of bison or ox. Um, so the animals like coming off the canvas. So it's interesting to uh, mix the pumice with, with paint and get all that thick texture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you pick up any pumice in New Mexico with all, all that? There, there's so much out there, a lot of construction of pumice too out there. Yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't pick up any other than a couple volcanic rocks. <laughs> no, it's gorgeous country out there. Oh, fantastic. Well, let me ask you, what are you, what are you uh, studying musically now? Like, have you been looking at any new pieces or working on anything? Nothing particularly. You know, when I get a chance to practice, I'll usually just go through and um, pick out some old favorites uh, just to see if I can play them as, you know, you can kind of gauge like, okay, how rusty am I and pull out the Mozart bassoon concerto <laughs> and, uh, or, you know, Ravel. There is some certain ones that I tend to pick up that I know that can quickly gauge where I am. Yeah, yeah. And you are practicing during this quarantine? You are playing? On and off. I, I am quite diverted in many directions, but, um, but I do get the itch from time to time. 
and I don't want to be too behind when we get going again. Oh, good, good. <laughs> I'm not too worried about you. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you have so many talents, serious talent that you pursue seriously. Um, what profession other than the one, the one or ones that you've taken up um, would you like to attend? Lately, I've been thinking, I wish I'd been an archeologist. Mm. I mean, I'm so, it's such a passion now with my artwork and um, like when we were in or Orkney Islands, I took my mom, sister and aunt last year, last fall at this time. And we went to the Orkney Islands and there are uh, current digs going on. And, and I would have loved to have been part of that type of thing. It's very hard to get into it now. There are a lot of people who want to be there because they're, they're discovering things that um, in nowhere else has such a, a rich depository of large temples and they're finding carved artwork and finding actual color on it and left over. So they, they're kind of, they're redefining what they knew about that time. So there's a lot, to, there's still a lot to be discovered and they keep finding things, especially in the Orkney Islands. Amazing, amazing. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you something a little bit off, off the wall. Um, how do you organize all your books and what are you reading now? My books? Yeah. Um, I have too many books. I have a stack near my bed. Um, I listen to a lot of audio books. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm able to consume a lot more that way. Whenever I get a chance, it's kind of my way to relax, especially if I'm working full time in digital marketing you know, my downtime is, you know, have lunch and, and listen to my audiobook or, or listen to it while I'm running. So I, I like historical fiction. Um, I also like murder mysteries, um, especially if it's an interesting place, like if it's in Scotland or England, uh, you know, the Dark Yorkshire series or something where, you, you know, you get a sense of the place um, that's going along with the story. And uh, as far as physical books, I, I'm learning, I'm reading a book by Brainerd Carey, who is a, he's an art advisor, advisor to artists on their career. Um, something that's demystifying the art world, I think what it is. So I'm continuing to try to learn how to crack the, the art world of how to get to the right people to, uh, that might be interested in, in what I'm doing. So uh, that's what I'm currently reading, but I have, I have many that I'd like to get to soon. Uh, one of which is my brother-in-law's book. He wrote a, an autobiographical um, book recently, and uh, I want to read that next. Interesting. Are you planning to exhibit anytime um, in the near future? Yes, but I'm trying to find the right venue. Um, made some really good contacts in, in uh, Santa Fe. I'm waiting to see if, if anything pans out from there. I think that would be the logical place for my work because the vibe is very much, you know, you have the petroglyphs, you know, people are more interested in, in ancient art there than, than Atlanta. You know, they're just not thinking about that kind of thing in Atlanta. Totally. Um, yeah. But unless they saw it and, you know, they, they kind of get, some people will, will get it for sure. But um, so I, you know, I could be just displaying some work in some galleries or I have a, I do have a large scale exhibit in mind that would have multimedia and have uh, some collaborations with, with other artists. So I would need a, a large space for that and, and probably locally to to pull that off but that may be a little more long term yeah no fabulous um so let me ask you the question i ask all the other interviewees if uh, heaven exists what would you like god or saint peter to say to you when you get to the pearly gates well i think like a lot of people i hope they say you know nice job Two thumbs up, you know. Um, hopefully, hopefully, my my scales are are weighed more in the uh, in the good deeds category than than I've done ill 
uh, during during my time here. So that's what I aspire. For.